Thank you, Nishar. Um, so uh, I want to welcome you all to the webinar this afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you to our speaker. Um, I did want to go to um, give you an update on the uh, future meetings and activities. So Nishan, if you'll flip to the next slide there that shows our um, upcoming meetings. Um, you'll see that in September, uh, and naturally we've converted all to, to virtual meetings for the time being until we can meet in person because historically we do a lot of um, site meetings, tours, presentations. Um, and so um, this uh, uh, virtual uh, avenue is, uh, is a little new to us, but uh, we're adjusting. So um, September 26th, we've got another presentation online. And this is kind of exciting. This is a program that we had uh, to cancel earlier in the spring, but it's um, a review of the net zero buildings that are being built downtown uh, by the California Department of General Services. Um, and uh, also presented with, by Glumac Engineers. So Nishant has set this up. I'm really looking forward to it because I've seen those buildings uh, rise up or get remodeled and um, know that they have a very ambitious goal of, uh, of um, zero net energy. So um, October, uh, we have a webinar that we're arranging now with um, one of the um, uh, uh, the professors at NREL um, to talk to us about uh, solar storage and microgrids, um, energy and water resilience. I mean, those are big subjects. So we're gonna handle it kind of um, as an overview and then some deep dives into your specific questions or, or areas of, of interest. So that should be a good uh, program in October. Um, November, we're setting up, this will be the first time we've ever had a panel discussion, but this is a panel discussion of uh, uh, energy engineers in the Sacramento area, uh, all names and um, uh, that you probably recognize. Uh, several of them are our former Energy Manager of the Year Award recipients. And uh, so Fred is gonna host this um, panel discussion. So uh, put that one on your calendar, that should be interesting. Come prepared with some questions and some uh, discussions uh, to have. With, um, and then in November, uh, Fred is also setting up this presentation by Steve Cromer, uh, a professional engineer that specializes in uh, M&V practices and has been one of the authors of the IPMVP for years. He conducts the training for um, the AEE uh, CMVP certification. So that's really going to be an interesting in-depth conversation and discussion uh, with Steve Cromer. So looking forward to some of those um, upcoming programs and then um, we'll be developing further programs for our monthly meetings all the way through the end of uh, June or July of uh, 2021. So look forward to having you all participate in that. Um, I do want to take a, a a moment here, if you will go to the next slide, please, Nishant, uh, to introduce to you our board of directors for NorCal AAE chapter. Uh, I'm your president. Um, I also do the newsletter. Uh, the vice president this year, right, currently is Josh Sharpertar. Our secretary, Fred Twaits, is on the, uh, on the presentation, as well as Brian Lina, our, one of our founding members, who is uh, continuing to serve as treasurer. And uh, Brian Tanahashi is our past president. Nishant Aurora is one of our members at large. And then one of our newest board members is Heather Benner. So I wanna thank all of them for the time and effort that they uh, put into making this chapter um, engaged in the local uh, engineering profession and uh, really believe that, um, that uh, the, the time and effort that we put into hosting these kind of events are, are well worthwhile. So um, if you'll allow me to speak philosophically for a moment, you know, the, um, the first law of thermodynamics is that energy can never be created or destroyed. Well, um, our time doesn't abide by that same law where our time is our very precious non-renewable commodity. And so it can be destroyed. Um, and so we really want to um, appreciate and make useful uh, 
um, the best use of our time. So I want to thank the board members for all that they do and the time that they spent. Our presenter this evening, uh, this afternoon, uh, Rob, um, and um, then all of you that have joined uh, the call. Uh, I think this is going to be an enhancement and hopefully we'll, uh, uh, you'll uh, decide that it was a, a good um, expense of your time. So uh, with that, let me um, introduce our speaker for the afternoon, Rob Bremolt with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric. Rob is a professional engineer in Canada. Um, that's interesting to me, Rob. I'm not sure I've ever met a Canadian professional engineer. I'd be interested, do you have to be registered uh, in each province or um, is it countrywide? It is countrywide and you'll know a Canadian engineer by their pinky ring. It's an oath we take about, um, you know, what we do with the public. So if you see a, a iron ring on the working hand, you'll know that's a Canadian engineer. Okay, I assume that iron ring is probably accompanied by a little green uh, mark underneath it. <laughs> I think so, yeah, but we never take it off our working hand. It's a closed ceremony for engineers, just, you know, the oath to society that we're going to not build anything that puts the public at risk. So Interesting, interesting. I think well, it you. comes from the British <laughs> and uh -huh. Canada not, uh, not still being part of a commonwealth. Uh-huh. Very good, very good. Well, proud to have you. Uh, in addition to being a, a professional engineer in Canada, Rob holds an MBA in finance and marketing from uh, UC Davis. Yay, go Aggies. Uh, he's got 35 years of experience in the utility industry, working for Alberta Power, SMUD, uh, Energy, Energy Exemplar, uh, American, California American Water and Cyborg Systems, and he volunteers with the Friends of the Powerhouse in Folsom. So, Rob, thank you so much for being with us, and we look forward to our presentation and um, just uh, uh, looking forward to it. So, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Tim, and thanks, Nishan, for inviting me to, um, you know, get to see some familiar faces, hopefully. I was part of AEE probably around 15, 20 years ago, and then I left SMUD in 2008 and went out and did a couple different things, some with the water industry, some with a software company in Australia, um, pushed carts at Costco for a year and lost 30 pounds, um, and then decided to come back into a big organization having a lot of problems in rates and regulatory affairs. So I joined PG&E back about five years ago. Um, back to kind of my core, I started out out of mechanical engineering at Alberta Power right into the rates department. They hire a lot of engineers to do their rate proceedings, a lot of spreadsheet, a lot of calculations, but at least we understand what a kilowatt and a kilowatt hour is. So engineers get licensed up there as rate engineers or electrical engineers. My, my education is mechanical engineering, but my PE is in rates and cost of service. So in SMUD, I, I was hired in 89 and they sponsored my green card. I came down and my wife, who's from Sacramento area, and I have been here, you know, since 89 and right after the earthquake and the closure of Rancho Seco, which was the nuclear plant. So I've, I've always been in electric industry, water, and anything related to the electric industry. And, you know, having heard about NREL, NREL was one of my top clients selling stochastic simulation models for integration of wind and solar into the grid. And so I really enjoyed going to Gold and, and working with some of those PhDs that are really doing incredible, you know, analytical work about what it takes to implement 100% renewable portfolio you know, and we've seen the problems of doing that with our latest rotating blackouts. Okay, so some people are calling it green out. It, it's not a green out. It's really a learning lesson for us all about what happens when the entire West needs a tremendous amount of load, um, a tremendous amount of power to meet that load. And we're so reliant in California on imports. So we can talk about that in a whole other, other day. 
So, but today I was going to take about um, about 10 slides, maybe two minutes a slide. So we leave it open for some questions and discussion. But my presentation is, is pretty much a canned presentation. I've done a couple of different ones internally within pg &E and also with our customers. We do a twice a year, a webinar with our customers about rate projections, bankruptcy proceedings, uh, power supply, public safety shutdowns, you know, the host of different things you probably read about in the newspaper. Um, other than Erin Brockovich coming online and giving her address, we, we've we got so much going on at PG&E, the best and the worst really happens in California first. But I'm going to talk about rate making process and how what I think these rates are, are an initiative for a better California, right? PG&E's slogan is a better California. And I really believe what, what we're doing is trying to be the best while also you know, resolving some of the worst parts of a corporation operating in California. Um, so, you know, kind of a disclaimer, I, anything I, you know, I talk about in terms of rates ultimately has to be approved by the California Public Utilities Commission and often the legislature. So I'm going to share with you kind of some of my thoughts. I think it echoes a lot of our senior officers at PG&E, but it is kind of my thoughts about where where we're going with rates. A lot of it is litigated rate cases. So there's a lot of attorneys, there's administrative law judges involved. Um, but me as an expert witness, as a rate engineer, I'm part of that dynamics. But they're they're ultimately responsible, you know, five appointed commissioners uh, appointed by the governor to make these tough policy decisions at, on rates and programs. So next slide, Nishant. Um, so yeah, the agenda, I want you to kind of take away that, you know, what is an investor owned utilities revenue requirement? We have a 14 billion requirement of revenues to run a company that's a, a monopoly in a lot of respects. In a lot of respects, it's not a monopoly. We're very um, cut away at the fringes. There's a lot of activities politically and with solar, it all kind of nips away at the edges of a big investor on utility. And I like to say we're a sandbox. We want everyone to play in that sandbox, including the competitors that want to nip us in the butt. Um, and so we have a, a requirement to allocate our revenue requirement and to rate and to design rates that are fair and equitable. Now, what's fair to me may not be fair to you. Um, so uh, it's a real dynamic litigated process. And how and when and where does rate making play a part in our proceedings? It pretty much touches every uh, proceeding at the commission, whether it be net zero energy homes, whether it be net energy metering, whether it be um, our bankruptcy proceeding, it all um, has a rate component. So where I sit, I get to see a lot of what's happening out there. And then I want to talk about who approves it. The legislature is more active than ever in our proceedings. And um, yeah, we get a lot of press um, for good or for bad. But working within a company, you always know that what you read about and what you're involved in some, sometimes is a real big disconnect. What I read about pg and &E is at a grade six level. And as you get deeper into these topics, you really start uncovering, you know, a, a university level understanding of a topic. But the, none of the newspapers are going to report that level to the public. So yeah, I hope to be a resource to you all if you want, you know, to move from grade six reading to grade 10 to university reading on, on a lot of things that come up on, on anything related to pg and &E. And why are they important in development of programs? And as ESCOs, as energy service companies, you're in there working with our same customers. Your customers are our customers. Um, pg and &E is kind of like a shield. They have no choice but to deal with me. <laughs> So when I work with customers, it's in that understanding that I value their partnership and I'm there to try to solve problems. And there's enough problems for, to keep me busy in my whole career. Um, and can these rates be a, a tool for a better California? And when I say better, I'm referring to safety. You know, um, we can afford to have wildfire storms caused by uh, electric sparks. 
In Canada, we call that force majeure act of God. Here in California, we are held responsible for a spark. And um, the law dictates that. We're kind of an insurance company of last resort. We get subrogated by other insurance companies when claims for fire damage caused by a power line spark. So we take that very seriously, but it affects the reliability. Should we underground the whole state to um, prevent wildfires? Well, we all know that's not the best answer. It's not the most effective answer, um, but there's a real emotional desire to um, prevent sparks from power lines. And what do we do about the environment? When I work with the National Park Service, there's a real desire to not disrupt the earth, not flood another valley not dispose of nuclear waste the way practices have been in the past. So, you know, a better California is one that has all that at the forefront. You know, independent of what's happening at the uh, federal level, we want to uh, continue to lead in that effort while, while at the same time learning about our worst decisions. We're leaders in the best and the worst. And the people that are here, the people that support those kind of programs, we we want to foster them, the employees that we have, the IBW blue collar union workers, right up to the executives, you know, that come into PG&E to run a, a billion, $16 billion company. Um, they see PG&E as just the epitome of, of the utility industry in America. Um, while at the same time, our rates are the highest in the nation, you know, at SMUD, we used to say people don't pay rates, they pay bills. So if the rates are 50 cents a kilowatt hour, but their bill is $2 because they're so efficient or they have so much self-generation, you know, we, we need to focus on bills. But at the same time, <laughs> rates times usage is, is the bill. So there's no way I can get away from having affordable rates, you know, and programs that are cost effective. And then interaction with, with your customers, your clients as ESCOs, my, our, our federal and state customers. Um, and I am just so happy to be working with the, the federal parks, national parks. I have um, US Bureau of Reclamation, the USDA, and I'm dealing with a whole new generation of federal government workers that really want to do clean energy projects here in California, whether they be based in Virginia or in Colorado. So next slide. So yeah, there's just, I'm going to be leaving these, these deck with you, but there's all, I always start this out. When I started rate making in 86, there was a, a guru by the name of James Bonbright, and, and he wrote the principles for the National um, uh, Regulatory Utility Commission. You know, this is what commissioners are to look at when approving rates, that, you know, these rate attributes be simple and understandable to the public and that they be feasible to apply in a billing system and interpreted on the bill. Um, and they be effective in yielding this utilities revenue requirement. If we're not, you know, contributing, uh, whether that include a profit component or not, it has to recover the cost. Otherwise, the services can't be provided. Um, and it has to be somewhat stable. If we're bankrupt one year and we're flush in cash the other year, then that's not a stable company providing a fundamental utility service to the public. Um, and that they be minimal unexpected changes. There's not volatility in rates up and down um, to customers, whether they be a grocery store or a industrial plant or a residential homeowner. And there's this concept of fair and equitable rate making. Fairness, it has to be fair when I take the pie of 14 billion and I have to carve it up into pieces and assign a certain recovery from a residential class and a certain recovery from a small business class, that that apportionment be based on the cost of service studies that we do and it be fair. Now again, fairness is a matter of perspective and economists and I, we can fight tooth and nail on what is cost of service and what is fair. So it creates a very dynamic uh, regulatory uh, forum and that we're not discriminatory. We're not gonna create rates that push solar out of the industry. We're not gonna use our utility monopoly status to create un 
do discriminatory rates. We abide by uh, public policy from the legislature that enables a discount for low income or for medical life support. So we're not going to discriminate against those that have special needs as a public policy. So the utility becomes a little bit like the IRS in disseminating discounts to different disadvantaged and low income. But you know, that is part of our paradigm and part of our charter as a utility that we really are part of that economic and income level um, dissemination of utility costs. And then the last most important in California is that we're promoting efficient use. We're compete with um, innovative products and rebates and incentives to really push the market forward in terms of new technologies and the most efficient use. So with that, I can say that pretty much all of these, you know, seven points get violated every day in my job in that it's a balance of all of these points. When I try to do something that recovers revenue, I have to make it so complex that it can't be billed. So it started out with these core principles, but it's evolved to a much more dynamic and much more complex. And it, it's hard not to look at this list and go, well, you're not doing any of this stuff. You declare bankruptcy. So that, that is the ultimate lack of stability right? And this is our second bankruptcy of getting through a financial crisis of market transformation with trading and deregulation and now with wildfire litigation costs. So next slide. So this is just a lot of words, but just to break it down for you, these are kind of the four steps of rate making that we go through. There's a whole phase one in our general rate case that deals with revenue requirement. And there's a separate proceeding at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission level related to transmission revenue requirement. And so these two uh, forums, uh, CPUC and FERC, both have revenue requirement that they go through to determine how much money do we need to run these systems. Transmission for, SAC, for, uh, for just PG&E is $2.2 billion a year, and the bulk of the rest of the revenue requirement for distribution and generation and public purpose is around um, $12 billion a year. So the state, the interstate issues are much more than the, than the interstate, intrastate and interstate. Anything that translates into interstate commerce is federal. So the only part that a pg e makes money on that is different from SMUD is what we call rate base. When we use our own capital, our, our shareholders' capital, in terms of putting an asset into rate base that is financed, there's a weighted average cost of capital that is earned by the shareholder, and that is regulated by the utility commission. So that commission will say, well, we're gonna give you 10% on that return, rate of return on your rate base. And what is in rate base is a whole forum of attorneys that say they don't want that in rate base to pay the 10% return. Um, and municipal utilities, uh, public, uh, publicly owned utilities, they may not have shareholders, but they have bondholders. And those bondholders are making a return on that same rate base, not based on a risk reward mechanism like stocks, but more like a certificate value like bonds. So the only difference between a municipal and a PG&E is that risk, or risk and reward of a shareholder, you know, making a return on the capital investment in the grid or in the generation plan. And without shareholders, whether it be CalPERS or other pension funds, you know, we wouldn't have access to anything other than the bond market, right? We're accessing now the equity market. And so when the bonds are up, 
you know, equity is down. There's always this balance at PG&E between bonds and stocks. In the public sector, you're all into bonds. That's municipal bonds is your only source of, of um, capital other than uh, funds, may, uh, retained earnings or retained cash that the utility may have. So then the pie gets, the, the pie has been put together in the revenue requirement. The second column here is splitting up the pie. I am just cutting the pie. I am not responsible for whose piece of the pie is bigger than the other. This, this becomes the mechanism of revenue allocation. In our uh, process, that is determined in a quasi-judicial case. And the parties will generally settle with PG&E rather than having an administrative judge or the CPUC vote on that allocation. The parties will meet every three years and we will determine what's fair and equitable rather than having a commission dictate what they think is fair and equitable. There's, there seems to be this real hesitancy of letting the commission rule rather than settling amongst the parties, which I think is a good way to proceed. I mean, settling has everybody giving up a little <laughs> rather than um, taking it to a judge who's going to rule in nobody's favor or in one or the other's favor. Um, I'm definitely into arbitration rather than divorce proceedings. <laughs> you know, you, I think you always want to arbitrate rather than litigate. The third bucket here is really about the art of rate design. The first two are very scientific, very economic based. When you get into rate design as to what the customer charge should look like, what the energy charge, should we have a demand charge, should we have time of use, that becomes a lot more of an art to balance, you know, usage and, uh, and high demand. Um, but you can move those levers up and down. And so um, by changing one, you get another. So a lot more flexibility in art than there is in science. And then after those three phases, now we have to approach our customers and our billing system and our reps and try to implement these rates. You know, a lot of the uh, the flaws are in that last implementation. We don't want to put rates that nobody wants, especially if they're you know electric vehicle charging rates. It's almost you need to flip the model around and have everything done on the implementation stage before we take it through a, a litigated proceedings. It would it would be so much better for the end use customer to have the solution kind of fall the problem defined well in advance of the solution, you know, to be able to have that customer. And we do that as much as we can within our business energy solutions group to try to get as much feedback as we can from trade pros like yourself and end use customers. But uh, I must say everyone's so busy getting on the radar when it talks about, when you talk about electric bill or a gas bill, water sewer bill, um, companies have so much on their plate, especially with COVID and employee issues and, you know, supply chain. It's, it, we're just one part of their bigger pie. So next slide. So this, I'm not going to go through, but we have the general rate case at the beginning. We have a rate design window in which we go through and we can actually do some rate tweaking and design in between this three to four year GRC cycle. We have um, a very controversial era proceeding, energy resource recovery account. This is dealing with um, what the CCAs call exit fees. We're trying to collect uh, um, committed contracts that were signed before a lot of customers started to choose their CCA provider. So, the state has allowed us to continue to collect contract costs that were signed to foster um, renewable and um, green technologies, as well as our Diablo nuclear plant. No one would want to pay for it if given the choice. So this um, power charge and difference ad adjustment, the PCIA, also known as exit fee by those that don't like it, is for those costs that are above current market conditions. 
Um, we also have um, different orders of instituting rate making, OIRs. And I think the last time I counted, there were probably 27 different proceedings going on at the commission related to different types of rate related programs or services. And those are just open proceedings. We have advice letters that are submitted all the time to inform the commission and the public on implementing any decision that has been made. So it is a job in itself just to track what's going on at pg e at the commission, let alone participate in it. And then, like I said, the transmission rates are all done at the federal level. So next slide. So the Public Utilities Commission in San Francisco and here in Sacramento, we now have a Sacramento office at One Capital Mall with probably two, two of the five commissioners are located there and a staff of energy division. So I think people were realizing it was expensive to, to house and to attract regulatory staff. So Sacramento became kind of a satellite. Now with COVID and sheltering at home, maybe the uh, commission staff will be more virtual too. Um, but they are the ultimate decision maker on uh, the different components of rate approvals. And we do our rate making on a forecast basis. So it's always what next year's sales will look like, what next year's weather will look like, and what next year's costs will look like. And with COVID, I think you're gonna see a real shifting of reduction in sales. And because the rate is a numerator divided by a denominator, if the denominator goes down, then the rate has to go up, right? To recover the same revenue requirements. So projecting what will happen in 2021 with businesses coming back and people's residential homes going down is gonna be a real challenge. So we may see um, more rate freezes to wait to see what happens with sales um, forecasts going forward. Next slide. So this revenue allocation breaks down all of these different components of our revenue requirement, right? Generation, the power plant at the utility scale, Diablo Canyon, natural gas power plants, the hydro facilities. Then we move into transmission and distribution, the power lines at the high voltage or the low voltage, above ground, underground. There's some old transition charges from the deregulation days of power costs that are no longer in the system that are non-bypassable. We have public purpose programs, whether it be low income subsidies or uneconomic energy efficiency. We still want energy efficiency programs, but maybe it's cheaper to buy gas and run a power plant. We have a big uh, component of nuclear decommissioning, getting ready for Diablo Canyon to come offline and decommission that. Um, different other components here that are all part of the big pie and different methods of splitting up that pie, either based on a peak demand or based on the amount of energy use of that class. Um, so there's a number of different methods of breaking that out into the customer segments. Next slide. And this is just a picture of what the pie is broken out into. You can see that distribution, the power lines at the low voltage are 4.5 billion of the total 13 billion. So it's a pretty big piece of of that pie that needs to then be split up into the different customer groups. Generation, whether it be market prices or uh, below or above market is all the blue. So generation is still the biggest piece, then distribution, then transmission in orange. And then as you get into the smaller pieces of the pie, it, it's still significant, but it's not as big as the the generation and distribution. You know, people will say, I need a, a rate impact for an increase of 7 million for a program. And I tell them that doesn't even change the rate in the fifth decimal to me. If, if you don't have anything more than 7 million, 
you know, it doesn't have a rate impact. Now that said, when you start adding up 7 million here and 7 million there, you know, you have a lot of impacts to rates. So someone, we try to educate the, the sum of the parts makes up the impact to the state in terms of higher rates. And that each of these parts has to be evaluated and, and be um, holistically looked at as what's best for California and what's best for our customers. So next slide. So in the rate design part, if you've looked at your SMUD bill or your versus your PG&E bill, my SMUD bill has a $21 per month fixed infrastructure or customer charge, independent of how much energy I use, $21. At PG&E, that customer charge is zero. There is no customer charge because the commission and the interveners in San Francisco do not want to impact low income with a customer charge. Um, so it becomes a very social public policy issue, even with a basic fee um, as applied to a bill at a residential level. On the commercial level, you know, our customer charge could be $1,000 a month to recover just the metering and billing. Um, the costs of metering and billing for residential all get rolled into the energy charge. So this is where I mentioned the lever you can play with the levers and move things around within these charges, but you would think the energy uh, charge would recover energy related uh, costs and a customer charge would recover fixed costs that are independent of energy use. Uh, but the art of all of that is there's these buckets are moving around. And so with um, commercial customers, because they have a meter that meters their highest demand in the month, they would get charged for the peak demand in that period or in that month. So it's only business customers that understand KW and get charged for KW and really provides an incentive for ESCOs and for us all to reduce demand on the system, preferably at the right time of day. And then that sum of all that is makes up their total rate. And you know, people have tools to look at it on a daily basis, but generally they'll get their bill after all of this has been used and they'll either be in shock or try to figure out how, how that bill occurred after the fact, you know, and, and hope they don't do it again if there's some piece of equipment that's not operating. So, you know, with Johnson Controls and any kind of energy management system that gives people tools to, to prepare for these kind of billing issues or notifications on supply shutdowns for wildfire. It's all about information tools to the customer to, to allow them to be proactive instead of reactive. Next slide. So some of you are getting even more familiar at the residential level about time of use rates. We, are, we all probably remember it from our cell phone days when we, or our, our AT&T days of you know, you never called family members other than on the weekend. Uh, but now in energy, it's about how do you encourage customers not to turn on their air conditioning during the peak period here in Sacramento. In San Francisco, it's less weather patterns. And so it, these time of use rates are becoming a lot more of a tool to try to encourage customers to use energy when the, the uh, the cost and availability of energy is the greatest. Um, and because of um, a lot of implementation of solar, we're seeing that peak period going later in the evening, right? It's now when the sun goes down and the air conditioners are still on, the utility peak net, net of solar is later in the evening than it was even 10 years ago. So that's a very quick change in a system of a utility having to plan for power plants and import contracts to respond to this changing peak. And I think the state, we all got caught with our pants down for two days having to do rolling blackouts because that was not prepared for. And so it was a wake up call, but it, it will just create so much progress and movement in our renewable portfolio, our hydro optimization and our multi-state interactions. It'll, 
it has to be a multi-state, not just California issue for it to work for everyone. We, we are not an island, although, you know, I think they'd like us to be in a lot of other states. So next slide. And this one I, I wanted to put out, this is really the only slide that I find progressive and exciting is that this is where we're really heading for a number of different issues related to wildfire resiliency. You know, it's a combination of a utility and a microgrid or more distributed energy resources at the local level or at, at the campus level or at the customer level. When you, you start combining solar panels with storage, some type of battery storage or thermal storage or any kind of transfer of mechanical, chemical to electrical, you start being able to meet a, a longer period of time should we have a peak system and, and really arbitrage rates around time of use rates. You add electric vehicles in that and you've got a pretty tight system that still has an umbilical cord to the grid, you know, to be able to get the best of both. But that microgrid or distributed energy resource started, starts to becoming the way of the future, just like mainframes to PCs. And I would like to see more customers disconnect from the grid um, they avoid a lot of charges, for one, from PG&E, but it really tests individual customers' ability and trust that these systems can really work, that they, they can meet their needs. They have syst you know, control systems, energy management systems that makes them their own utility or own power plant. Um, the pricing, we're trying to get there to encourage it. A lot of it is moved to subscription rates where you sign up for this rate. Then we know how much we have to be as a grid provider responsible for. And the prices that we encourage are such that takes them off peak. Um, even at 17 cents, that is a high rate, but compared to 50 cents, you know, it starts moving um, systems around. And with storage, you can do this charging and discharging. Um, my only concern when I look at this is I know what lithium mining can do to a lot of countries. And, you know, from the cradle to cradle perspective, I, I just have a lot of concerns from a bro even a broader perspective about lithium by batteries at utility scale without some real uh, changes to the way we reclaim land and, and deal with pop people issues in these countries that have lithium mining. So next slide. So yeah, with that, I, I, the key takeaways, you know, there's, a, there's hopefully two or three nuggets of information you all were able to garner from this, but the, this whole rate making within a utility is really a team sport. It, it requires my interaction with more trade pros like yourself, um, my interaction with customers directly, um, my interaction with the interveners and lawyers that are trying to fight for their clients. I get to talk to some legislators, um, but we have a lot of ex parte rules that, you know, we're not supposed to try to influence their decision making in rates, and, and we definitely respect that. And, and abide by it, it's a legal requirement. Um, but it really needs to be a, a collaborative approach by the utility with all of these players in order for us all to be effective. And then just the regulatory lead and lag. The, the regulators can't keep up with these filings and the market issues and the customer demands. Um, at some point, this all goes into a mode of hyperspeed and be able to meet customers' requests and be flexible on the utility scale. I'm, I'm kind of known as a troublemaker within SMUD and within pg e to really jump out of processes that are set in stone and to try and find solutions to customers' problems, whether it be bill, bills that are too high or reliability that's not high in being able to meet their 
their needs. And I think we also need to take a lot of our rates and get them back to simplicity and understanding. Too many time of use periods, too much you know, terms and conditions of interconnecting things. All of this needs to be cookie, cookie cutter and we all have to kind of take a little bit of the, the knowledge we've learned of the worst experiences and, and move it forward. And then putting the customer at the front of the curve, you know, putting them really at the driving seat. Um, even though, you know, they only have two minutes of time in front of the SMUD board or the PC to comment. You know, they're not part of the regulatory voice, their attorneys are, but really when we start talking directly with customers and put them in the driving seat, then we're coming to them with solutions of problems they have instead of des designing solutions and trying to find a problem. You know, the problems should be at the front. Next slide. So yeah, with that, I, I think we've got a, a little bit of time, more time for questions. And I've seen some pop up on the chat, so I'll let Nishant open the lines or read some of them and I'll try and provide more. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Rob. We do have a few questions that have come in through the chat. So um, I'll, uh, I'll take those one by one and, and pose them to you. And in the meantime, others can continue to um, drop their questions in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll get to them. I think we, have, we should have plenty of time here. Um, so first from, uh, from Tim, so on August 14th, the California ISO ordered these power shutdowns to avoid a failure of the grid due to demand exceeding supply. The sun went down and the wind died and the temperature went up. Uh, how are future rates designed to address this situation? Well, that's a, a good question. Future current rates are not designed for this kind of scenario. Um, demand response rates and programs are go going hyperspeed because of what happened. And the perfect storm of having uh, such high temperatures in Phoenix and Arizona on a southern path that normally would be importing power into, into California was not available. Um, the CAISO had been bringing this to the attention of the PUC and the legislature. So it was a little bit of regulatory finger pointing of who approves more local power or more fixed uh, import contracts. Um, but prices and rates um, we do have a, a, an active proceeding that's going faster in San Diego, gas and electric territory than in PG&E, but I think you'll see all three IOUs go more uh, hyperspeed with it. And that's dynamic pricing, where we are sending um, hourly CAISO prices with a capacity adder for these kind of um, constraint issues if we run into and not enough um, resource adequacy, uh, capacity adequacy in the Western grid. So um, dynamic pricing, it used to be called real-time pricing. It's more dynamic now that, you know, will customers accept or opt in to, to more dynamic pricing that can trigger prices that signal conservation or bidding of their load into when we really need it. Apparently the Army and Air Force and a number of companies in California responded to Governor Newsom's staff call when he called them on the phone and they were able to drop load. But it wasn't the rates or pricing at the time that caused that. It was public policy, right? So we avoided, I think we avoided Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. Tuesday was the, the hottest temperature, um, but Friday and Saturday was when we did the outages and it was because nobody was, they weren't ready. The reserve margins in California hit 5% and, and that is critical where we could have grid collapse. So, and we didn't know about it till 10 in the morning of that day. Um, and how do you how do you educate and prepare people for something you only give them four hours notification that the grid in the entire state may collapse? Yeah, it's similar to a power line going on fire in Oregon and our lights go out. 
because the grid at that time is unable to um, meet it. It's, it's we know about <laughs> path of least resistance, <laughs> the the whole basics of electric flow, and it can collapse if at a particular time you haven't planned for n minus one or n minus two contingency, and don't have enough reserves. Does that answer kind of Tim or? It does, and it also kind of answers my, my next question that Fred, Fred's going to read. So, uh, but uh, go ahead, Fred. Well, sure. Maybe we'll just we'll just uh, address it here. So then, uh, the other question from Tim was why why aren't there more uh, demand reduction programs? We see aggressive goals for renewables, but not nearly as aggressive on the DR side. You know, it's interesting. There's two gentlemen at PG&E that asked that same question is why can't we treat demand like supply? We've been talking about this for probably 15 years that demand is supply. And we've dabbled in, you know, 15, 10 minute load shed, uh, industrial gas customers, they can shed, shed load quickly. So they're almost like a power plant um, with quick start capability. Uh, we have demand aggregators, the e Enernoc and a whole bunch of companies that would aggregate to be able to bid in one block. You know, I think a lot of it is cultural. The utility industry, the CAISO, the regulators aren't used to herding cats and having confidence that all those cats can generate a thousand megawatts of power. And it, I think it is going to be up to Johnson Controls and control companies to have such tight controls over those cats that it's bid in and it responds and it's reliable and the prices reward um, companies who are going to be on the verge of being shut down anyway that, you know, and everyone takes it seriously. So that's, I'm excited about those two days of outages because it will create the sense of urgency if we act on it and remind people about those two days and why it's important to do demand response. But until we start seeing that it's big block power and others have tried, but you know, here again, we, we failed with two days and let's use it to our advantage. Awesome, thanks Rob. Uh, so we have a question here from, from Bobby Orwig. Uh, so given the duck curve and the high relative bills that you referenced earlier, uh, I see a feedback loop. I know that California solar sales industry is in full force. Yep. Uh, you mix in Title 24 regulations for all newly permitted buildings to have solar regardless of whether they're in a territory that is 100% covered by renewables or not. And uh, Bobby sees nothing but problematic over generation. So geopolitical issues around lithium also taken into account. Uh, what is the ideal conclusion from your point of view? Well, my realistic conclusion is that, you know, the train has already re left the station on solar and we're, we're going full steam ahead. Solar industries, the people that are selling solar, if, if they're over promising in terms of rate stability, but we have at the regulatory side, a decision that should have been voted on today, whether we're opening up a new net energy metering um, proceeding to start realizing that what we've encouraged solar is on the backs of customers that are non-solar. So, you know, part of our, I don't want to say our rate increases are driven by solar. The duck curve has been driven by solar. Um, the ability now to throw in storage solves a lot of that duck curve issue. So I had learned at SMUD from, you know, Jan Shorey, a very wise general manager after closing the nuclear plant is don't put all your eggs in one basket. And we've put all our eggs in solar basket. So in order to diversify out of solar and, and minimize that risk of 100% solar. It should, should be 100% renewables with also some natural gas to really ensure that if we're in a drought and we don't have hydro and we have cloud cover and, you know, a wind condition that doesn't have the turbines, 
you know, that 100% renewable, we're not like Iceland where we have all this geothermal energy that is, is it, it's renewable, but it's also carbon releasing or GHG releasing if you don't use it. So I just don't know how we would put a diversified portfolio of renewables demand response. I think it'll, it, it'll come together and natural gas will be, out of, will be out of the picture just like coal based on the economics and based on the carbon price that will be more transparent. So, you know, what is, what is the ideal conclusion? I mean, my conclusion ideally is climate change is our number one threat and a, the cleanest possible portfolio of customer solutions, utility solutions, um, building codes, you know, maybe solar on every home wasn't the best title to put in there. Community solar versus mandating solar on a home. Um, but ultimately we will get to 100% renewable with storage and, you know, we will capture and close every loop of the release of greenhouse gas. There, there should be no need to vent carbon back into the atmosphere. It can, it can be captured, it can be utilized and close that loop. Um, so yeah, that's what, it, and it's happening around the world. So we might as well be the best and the worst. And, and this, that next, this next question, I think actually ties into that quite nicely and it's from Nishant, which is, He's point, he points out that in a, in a society where eventually we're going to be 100% renewables, um, do you think that adjusted with inflation costs will be higher or lower and, and what will contribute to that? Well, you know, our, our driver from a rates and utilities is affordability and, and rates are only affordable if your income is going up such that 50 cents a kilowatt hour is affordable, right? So whenever I think of rates affordability, I think of, you know, income disparity, which is way out of the scope of the utility. You know, we can't just throw more discounts at low income, but if, if electric rates are, and, and gas prices in Europe, if they're, you know, at $2 a liter uh, versus $1.25 or even $3 a gallon, you start realizing uh, the behavior changes and yeah, the inflation, will our rates be affordable or, or are people going to be left behind that will never be able to afford a rate and do the kind of programs that they need to bring their homes up to efficient standards, electric cars, you know, and I don't, I don't have the answer in, in America because Americans don't like to pay higher taxes. So you know, that we're, the utility is utilized as an IRS in a lot of regard. So um, I think it's going to, it'll move there, but it's not going to move without a lot of um, give and take by um, citizens in, in this state anyway, to recognize that we all have to go there together, not on the backs of those that can install solar and not on the backs of huge subsidies and giveaways um, for not participating in the solution. You know, where I live in Gold River, this is a very uh, Republican neighborhood with a lot of um, very conservative, very angry people that, you know, they don't want to see any more subsidies. You need, to, you need to get out there and really fight. And I just don't think that's, you know, a realistic neighborhood to to encourage that without bringing everybody along with you. That's the Canadian in me, I guess. Um, I have a question for you, Rob. Uh, so I, I have a, a customer that, that I'm, or client that I'm working with right now on a, um, an energy savings performance contract. And um, one of the parts of it that we're developing is, uh, is co-generation. Yeah. Um, as well as solar, actually, both solar and cogeneration are a part of the project. Um, and I'm curious, you know, the solar gets treated under the net energy metering rate, 
Um, the other, the CHP, uh, I think will be treated as, um, you know, with, with departing load, basically some of the same charges that you see with a CCA, like the PCIA, uh, the, you know, the PPP charge still, things like that. I'm curious um, why the designation, what's been told to me is basically we want to, I mean, we obviously want to promote clean green energy on the grid, but, um, but, but can you, if you can explain a little more in depth how those are treated differently, say, say cogeneration versus solar? So cogeneration from a utility perspective used to be deferred just, or deterred. We had cogen deferral rates. We didn't want cogen, right? And so then we moved into more promotion of capturing the thermal energy uh, needed by the customer while also providing natural gas sales, right? So with cogeneration, you still have the use of natural gas. In this all electrificated world, there is no natural gas system. And we're, a lot of us are preparing for that. So when you say we're treating cogeneration, anything that decreases the kilowatt hour usage has a vintage associated with prior commitments made. So the PCIA that's applied to CCA departures, it's not an exit fee, it has a vintage of expiration, but if they depart for lower cost, if cogeneration and solar is cheaper than pg e rates, then that's the wise solution to go to, right? The market has transitioned such that solar prices are down and other technologies are lower than the contracts and commitments that were made even 10 years ago. Now those commitments were made for 20 years. And the reason that lower costs are occurring now is because of those longer term commitments to try to drive the market from the state regulators and policy. This wasn't necessarily a pg e uh, option. It was, we you will get on board with the state's clean goals or you'll lose every fight. So pg e is, in my mind, the greenest culture utility. The people think and breathe green energy. There's no fossil fuel group that's trying to hold us back. So the rate side, why, why are we treating these differently is more around just the basics of how do we recover prior commitment costs. And it's done in these buckets that are pretty crude and hard to understand when you're trying to do cogen and solar at the same time. But, you know, you and I should talk offline because there's the ability to look at this as an entire portfolio with our strategic account managers and jump out of some of these rate boxes that might not be the best win-win for the customer pg e and the parties involved. So yeah, when you start seeing these blockages, understand that the blockages are there for a reason, but when you're, when you're combining a whole bunch of stuff together, that's when you got, you got to um, approach pg e with, with um, the problem and we'll come up with a solution. Who's the customer, by the way, or do you, we can talk offline? Well, this is a this is an SCE territory. Um, yeah, well, I have friends down there. They should be doing the same thing. We we get together twice a year, and there is a desire for joint utility actions. And um, yeah, we can I can help. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll drop your line off. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so Nishant asks, uh, when do you see two-way vehicle to grid kicking off fully? So the first step we did is with um, um, our commercial EV charging program. Um, residential vehicle to grid has been a concept we've talked about for years where you charge and discharge the electric battery just like what the Tesla power walls are doing. So the power wall and, a v and an EV, given what we're doing with power walls and Tesla being, I guess they're just making incredible sales, that whole evolution of vehicle to grid will be coupled with battery storage in the form of power walls. Um, what, what was interesting, pg e found that all of Humboldt County's energy use was so high. Um, 
because they were growing marijuana up, up in Humboldt County prior to, you know, the law changing, but they were also having electric vehicles to get on a lower rate. Their usage was so high, so you had all these EVs up in Humboldt County sitting around as batteries that weren't being charged and discharged. So we had a group that went up there and said, can we just use you as a battery to lower your usage, you know, and be able to leverage it. Um, the, the automobile manufacturers don't like that charge and discharge of the battery because you can violate the warranty of the battery in some of that. So I think the, the whole EV industry is trying to crack that nut with the battery manufacturers that you can use them like a, like a storage device, charge and discharge. And as they're sitting in the home, it's just another Tesla wall. But Tesla is a very active participant in the preceding sun run. Um, there just needs to be, there's a whole collaboration of, of lobbyists and, lit, and litigators on the vehicle to grid. I'm, re I'm ready to buy my EV. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to pull the trigger on an EV and be able um, to sell anything because I'm just not driving that much. So might as well drive around in an EV rather than take two weeks to the gallon. So your other question, Tim, was CC's a threat. We had an executive CEO that saw CCAs as a threat and we launched all these campaigns against Marin Clean Energy and we ran commercials. Then the commission came down and said, you will not um, uh, try to obstruct local community power. We will make it indifferent to you. We will give you this PCIA and you will not be the bully and so I don't, I don't see them as a threat. I see them as very shrewd in the rate proceeding to get that PCIA as low as possible. So right now, PG&E serves less than 50% of the load generation in the state in our territory. It's grown over the past three years to around 60% of our kilowatt hours at the generation level are being provided by a CCA rather than pg &E. So when it tipped that high, we had a lot more generation that was out of the money that was uh, above market prices of what the CCAs were buying from wholesalers or building in their community. It got a lot more renewables on the grid, but it a lot, got a lot more stranded costs on our books. So we have a whole group and we are mandated to go through training about how we interact with CCAs and how we communicate about CCAs. So I view them as coopetition. They're my competitor and my collaborator, right? So when I meet SMUD and SMUD is working with Davis, how can I help you at PG&E be successful with Davis without threatening to hostile municipalization and tie it up in the courts for 10 years? There's still this public private, you know, one's better than the other. When we take away that basis, and the nice thing about engineers is we don't care about whether you're a private company or a public company, we want to do engineering and we want solutions. And so it, it depends who you talk to, but the CCAs, have the right model and they have the bond financing and they have the local control. So if you have a good board of supervisors and a mayor and a city council that doesn't get too, you know, off scope, if they're with it, stay within the scope of energy and not use it as a tool to get to the legislature or somewhere else, then they're super to work for. And East Bay Clean Energy, we're doing collaboration with them on the engineering side, but they continue to fight with us on the rate side. Their attorneys just want the lowest PCA, and I think I would do the same thing, right? If I was working for them, it was about, it's about hammering to get the lowest rate. But eventually Bakersfield, because they don't have a CCA rate, if, if we don't spread that pie evenly, then, then B Bakersfield's gonna have the highest rate in the state because they don't believe in local government providing their energy. Just a different culture down, oil and gas. So yeah, I'm a, 
I think we're over the threat. We're we're not going to. To we'd like to compete. We'd like to have a, a portfolio that they choose PG&E, but right now they're given to the CCA, and then the CC the customer has to opt back to us. So the only ones that opt back to us are are PG&E employees. And I say, why do you want to opt back to us? Take the discount from Marin and go. You can always come. It's not like a a moral decision or loyalty decision. Someone gives you a discount, take it. Because you'll always come back if that doesn't work out. If the discount goes away, you have a choice. So interesting times. Nishant, natural gas, hydrogen and renewable natural gas. Yeah, biogas. Um, there are, you know, just here in Sacramento, there's um, 15% of the gas provided to um, one of the power plants that SMUD owns is digester gas from the wastewater treatment plant, right? So it's qualified as new as renewable gas for that component. I think there's a lot more harvesting of, of uh, wastewater treatment gas, dairy digesters with, you know, the dairy industry. Um, it, it's, you're still burning a gas and just given the cost of solar and storage and all these other technologies coming down in price um, it, and the cost of putting in pipelines to move gas to uh, you know a generating facility um, but if you think gas will be here at least for one generation you might as well make it renewable gas and and I think we were all bullish on hydrogen as a fuel source, hydrogen fuel cells. Again, don't put all, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If there's a hydrogen fuel cell opportunity on there, jump on it. And you have, in order to produce hydrogen, you have to, you have to change that natural gas molecule to pull out the hydrogen. We've done it with solar, use solar to pull out the hydrogen molecule from a natural gas supply and there you have hydrogen. So it's kind of basic chemistry from college and you know mechanical conversions, but um, if there's an opportunity, we should, we should ensure that we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. Yeah, well, I've left my phone number there if you're shy or if you're from SMUD and you know who I am, I don't know who you are yet. But um, you can always call me or text me and I'll you know, be happy to you know, start a dialogue and get you information of what we're doing. But it's a small enough group with AEE. You know, it's nice to have um, these kind of conversations and expand on them, you know, as we go forward, you know, at home or eventually if we can do some uh, site tours or some events together again. Absolutely. Uh, well, thanks so much, Rob. Uh, it, it, it was a pleasure having you uh, for this uh, talk. We re really appreciate your uh, experience and this uh, meeting. So yeah, if, if anybody has any questions, you know, this video will be posted on our YouTube channel. So yeah, please do follow us on social media, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, our email address also. So feel free to reach out at contact.aenorcal uh, at gmail.com. So, yep, thanks so much. And uh, uh, looking forward to uh, some future meetings. Thank you.